five, four, three, two, one. We'll lift off of the Falcon 9. So this is the uh, Encyclopedia of Invisibility, um, and it is, uh, I think it's the first of its kind, research project made here in the studio, um, and it chronicles people, places, and things that are more or less invisible. The Encyclopedia was uh, a research project that was driven from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Like almost every kid growing up uh, in the 80s and 90s in the Bahamas, you had access to an encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, my grandmother had one at her house. She, was, she had the only copy in my whole family. And whenever we went over to our house on Sunday, we'd have to put, wear gloves and we'd open up this encyclopedia. It's, it was that precious because we had very limited resources and it was the only way we had information to the outside world. This is before the internet. So I was really curious about how, how the makers of the encyclopedia itself was coming up with all this information and how were they able to so succinctly uh, and so firmly shape my reality. And so I wanted to think about all the things that weren't in the encyclopedia and why they were not. And so it come, this in, sort of invisible narrative pops back up. Robert Henry Lawrence Jr. was the first black astronaut in America who was a hero, personal hero of mine and inspires me deeply. And he didn't get to go into space. He happened to die during a, a training exercise, during a routine flight. Robert Lawrence is exceptional because he was an astronaut at a time when the tensions in America specifically was so much so that to think of a, of a black man as an astronaut in, in 1966, 67, is quite, is quite fascinating. I mean, this is at the height of civil rights in America. It really has a, a deep relationship to someone who'd managed to transgress and gotten somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. And this is something that is really inspiring um, to me. The virus received a grant from the Art and Technology Lab in 2014. At this time, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Gwen Chatwell, and we literally sat in a room for about an hour. I said to Gwen, I was working on the story about Robert Henry Lawrence, and wouldn't it be fascinating to put uh, Robert Lawrence into space? Whatever that means, I didn't know what it meant at the time. Within a few minutes of conversation, uh, it was clear that we were gonna do it. First, we had to design the spacecraft. The shape was inspired by uh, the Egyptian collection at the LA County Museum. It's fashioned after uh, an ancient Egyptian canopic jar, which has a lot to do with storytelling, in the sense that the hieroglyphics are written on the outside, and each canopic jar has a kind of narrative written uh, in drawn form. So our canopic jar that will end up in space is a kind of story about Robert Henry Lawrence. We worked with a team of engineers from all over the United States to build the spacecraft. And we ended up building three different satellites. A test unit that would be used for environmental testing, a flight unit that would be the satellite that would actually go to space. And then we also built a display unit that would be used for exhibition purposes. And once the satellite was built, we had to acquire a deployer. This uh, deployer, it houses the satellite and it is attached to a larger spacecraft that is in turn attached to the rocket. Once the rocket reaches space, um, the deployer door opens and it ejects the satellite into orbit. One of the first tests that you have to do is the fit test. It's 
three, two, one, zero. Give it a couple more chances. Three, two, one, zero. So the next suite of tests will be vibration tests. And again, remember, this is to survive the launch. The deployer and the satellite inside it will be sitting inside this, this rocket. And they will be shaking, you know, violently and back, you know, as for, for eight minutes as they go into orbit. Um, they'll be vibrating very quickly in all kinds of, you know, different directions and at very high frequencies. And we want to make sure that this doesn't result in things like, you know, a screw coming loose, right? And we want to make sure that whatever vibrations we put into it won't cause that satellite to just, you know, shatter out of control. And then we did one last test. Okay, so this is the final test of the uh, Planetary Systems uh, canisterized satellite dispenser that we're going to perform here at its space flight's facility. So when I press the button, we expect a tenth of a second pause and then deployment. So let's go on three, two, one. And the CSD works, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing it work in space. Uh, thanks, guys. Finally, the flight unit was integrated and ready for launch. Good morning from SpaceX headquarters here in Hawthorne, California. This morning's Falcon 9 launch is scheduled for 10.34 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Falcon 9 and the payload are currently tracking no issues. The weather is go, the winds are go, and the range is green for an on-time launch today. Eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one.